Hi everybody, Professor Gassini here, and in this component of the lecture, we're going to be speaking about CSS boxes, borders, and overflow. As always, I do suggest that you take a look at the readings and the accompanying exercises contained within them, uh, either uh, concurrently or after you've seen this lecture. So everything in CSS that you'll be working with should be conceptualized as having a box around it, or a border, maybe. And it's important that you understand how that box, if you will, governs the aesthetic of the content that you're generating and specifying with CSS. When you're thinking about this box uh, or the box model, there's really four sections to it. There is an innermost place where we call the, the content area. And this is where if, for example, you had a paragraph tag, your text would be written. Between that content and the, the border of this box is padding. And padding is basically white space. The thing about padding is the more padding you add, the more it squishes the content because it can't escape the border. So you add more padding, just like into a real packaging box, it's going to squish the contents and make them uh, more and more compressed. Then, of course, you have the border itself. And this could be styled just like um, the content could be styled. You could make it thicker. You could make it, um, you could make it pink or yellow or whatever color you like. Um, and then, of course, outside this, we have the margin. And this margin is sort of like the margin on an essay, right? It's some white space that um, creates some breathing room between this box and uh, anything else that comes next to it. So let's look at an example so that you kind of understand this box. Let's say that you had a, I don't know, a paragraph, and you had defined in your CSS a class called box and that you had given this, this box uh, class a width and a height of 350 pixels, 150 pixels, respectively. And then either through your own specification or through inheritance, which, uh, as we learned in the last lecture, can happen, you have a margin and a padding and a border of 10, 25, and 5 pixels, respectively. Well, the thing to know is that when you have that uh, paragraph element, the content will be contained in this area, this 350 by 150. But when that paragraph is sort of operating within the greater structural context of HTML, it is not 350 by 150. It's, for example, its width would be 350 here, plus 25 for the um, padding on either side, which gets you to 400, plus 5 plus 10 times 2, which gets you to 430 for the total width of the thing, right? So you should keep that in mind because when a block structure is being created, um, the content is governed by one size, and the box that contains it is governed by the summation of the sizes of the content, the margin, the padding, and the border together. Now, if you ever want to, as you're playing around with your HTML and your CSS, you want to get an idea of what the, the border and the padding is on a particular element, you can inspect that element using the developer tools, basically by right-clicking and saying inspect. And then when you click it, as I'm showing here, you can get information on that right-hand panel on the margin, the border, and the padding. The developer tools section is something we will be going over in the tutorial if you haven't already seen it. Um, it's, it looks like a lot, but it's pretty straightforward, I think, the first time you play with it. I do want to note that the developer tools in Chrome versus Firefox are slightly different, but all developer tools will have something like what I'm showing you here in case you want to see what the border padding margin is for uh, that content area. So the margin, when we think about that box model, is the invisible space around the box. Okay? And margins will push other elements away from the box. The way I want to illustrate this is through some very simple HTML and CSS. So you can see at the bottom here, we have some extraordinarily simple HTML. We just have a, uh, a div. Its class is container. Within that, we have another div. Its class is box. It contains some text. Change my margin. OK, and what we have here is a CSS class box that's attached to this inner div. 
and it has four stylistic elements that we're displaying here. The first one is margin top, which is minus 40. Then we have margin right, 30, margin bottom, 40, and margin left, 4 EM. These different units, pixels versus EM, we will go over these in a minute. For now, all I want you to know is that there, you can specify different units when you're playing with um, sizing things in CSS. You can see, though, as a function of these different margin settings, we position the box within the other box differently, right? Because it sort of is pushing more strongly in one direction versus the other. In the case of margin top, we said minus 40, so it yanks it up this way. In the case of margin bottom, 40 pushes down this way. Margin right, 30 pixels, pulls it this way, and so on. The border area of the box is drawn between the margin and the padding of the box. Okay, that's, that's this here, right? If we have in this same div class container, we have an outer box, as you can see here, and then we have an inner box, like you can see here. Well, you can see there's all sorts of wonky things we've done with the border here. Um, for example, for the main container, we set the border top to be a five pixel dotted green line, which you can see here. And for example, the border of the inner box here, class box, we set the bottom border color to be hot pink. Okay, so this can be controlled differently in CSS, just like the margin can be controlled separately. The padding is again what sits between the border and the content area. And it's important to note that you can't have negative amounts of padding like you could with the margin. So in the previous example I showed you, we were able to adjust the margin to move things one way or the other, right? To push things or pull things away. You cannot do that with padding. Okay, as an, uh, just to make it clear how this uh, padding works, if we look at, for example, the box here and the padding, you can see that our padding on the top is zero. And so there's less uh, space here that separates the border edge from the text. The padding on the uh, right is 30 pixels versus the left. And so you see a, a difference in, for example, the spacing or uh, the perceived centering of the change my padding text in the center. And the padding on the bottom is, is 40 pixels, as is reflected here. Now, when you think about CSS, uh, one of the properties that you will probably want to change when you're styling things is the background color of your objects, your boxes, your uh, H1s, your H2s, your spans, and so on. And the background color property is what helps define the background colors on your CSS elements. So you can see here in this example, I took the box class, which is the main thing that wraps this, and I set the background color to using this hex code, this lovely kind of bluish gray tint. I can also, in addition to using a hex code, I want to note, can specify a color in kind of English text, like black. It's best not to do it this way. I know throughout the lectures I've done that just for the purposes of instruction and sort of illustrating how things work. It's usually best to use the hex codes. They're more specific and they're kind of easier to um, to extend or alter or modify in subtle ways that you don't get if you rely on just these um, static text color codes. Okay, And then uh, similarly, you can set the background color as well using uh, RGB and intensity scale, as I'm showing here for the span. Now, another thing that's common for people to do with backgrounds is not just set a color, but sometimes you might want to set an image, right? Instead of having, for example, blue, you might want to have some hot air balloons. Okay, And the way that you can control that um, is either by directly specifying the size of the image, which I think I had shown you in an earlier uh, part of this lecture. You just set the width and the height. You can do that either statically in pixels or by using a percentage to get a proportional scaling of the image. There's also two other things that I think are particularly useful when you're dealing with setting images as a background to a particular containing element. And one of those is to set the size of the image to something called cover. 
And what that does is it takes whatever the containing element is and it sort of will uh, stretch the image so that it covers the whole area but does not exceed it. There's also contain, which is similar to what you have in cover, except that it, it will make sure that every pixel of the original image is shown at the cost of filling up the whole area. So just to be clear about the distinction between cover and contain, let's look at these two images together. They're both in a box the same size. Notice that in the top image, the crowd that is gathering around the hot air balloons has been chopped off. That's because we stretched this image, we sort of inflated it until we had the whole area covered and then we stopped. And what we lost in that case was the crowd at the bottom there. Whereas in the contain circumstance, which is the bottom image, we wanted to be able to see the whole image, but if we didn't want to skewer the aspect ratio on this, which we could do, but it makes images look gnarly usually, um, to maintain that aspect ratio, we ended up having this not completely fill the space here. Now, as you're working with content in boxes that has its own padding and its margin and its border and so on, one of the issues that you may encounter is something called content overflow. This happens when you've specified the size of a container, a box, to be smaller than the area needed for the content within that box. I'm showing you two examples of this on the right-hand side. I'd like to step you through the HTML and the CSS so that you understand why this happens. So in this case, we have uh, a div and its class is box. So it's governed by the following CSS rules, which sets the border to be one pixel solid, sets the width to be 200, sets the height to be 100. The problem is that this div has got far too much text in it to be able to fit within that limited area. And so you can see here on the right-hand side that it spills out and creates this really ugly effect where the paragraph text here becomes illegible because the content in here is spilling out on top of it. Okay, you don't want this to happen uh, when you're dealing with your HTML and CSS layout. Okay, this can also happen not only in the Y direction, Y overflow, you can also have X overflow, which is what this row is intended to show you. The way that you handle overflow is with the overflow property in CSS, which I'm showing here. The simplest way to get rid of it is to just set the overflow to hidden, in which case, if we were to have the same HTML as we did before in that top row on the last slide, you could see that the content would simply just be cut off. It's as though it, we've got a viewing window into that thing and uh, anything that's outside of that viewing window is just not visible, it's gone. But there's actually other ways to handle this that don't make you completely uh, kind of sacrifice that, and that is to put a scroll bar on the side of the content as I'm showing here. The way you add this scroll bar is by setting the CSS property overflow to be auto, okay? And in this way, if any of the content spills out, you will automatically get a scroll bar here for your browser that will allow you to navigate and look through this content. 